Howdy, Philip here from Manning the Fort, and the new Black Templar supplement has arrived, uh, at least for me, and I have been reading through it for a big chunk of my weekend, and I can tell you it includes a lot of lore tidbits to bring the boys in black up to date with what's happening with the Indominus Crusade. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through some of those updates and what they could mean for the chapter. I'm also working on a video to give newcomers to the army a crash course in Black Templar's lore, as well as some Templar's hobby videos. So recently, Games Workshop and Black Library rolled back the entire timeline by about a century to place things in the thick of the Indominus Crusade, and the Black Templars are literally all over the map. Though there still seem to be occasional references in different pieces of lore that conflict on when exactly it is. As usual, the total number of Crusades and men under arms for the Black Templars is known only to High Marshal Helbrecht, but there are indications of a lot of active forces across the galaxy. Some of those Crusades have effectively disappeared since the opening of the Great Rift, but many are known to have survived, and many of the rest are believed to have survived. At the beginning of the Indominus Crusade, it's said that there is little doubt that the Black Templars are well in excess of the thousand marines each chapter is supposed to have. Maybe I'll do a future video about the loophole they used to do that. And speaking of Helbrecht, we have another telling of his meeting with Robute Gilliman. This meeting has been described before in 8th edition, but this version focuses on the anticipation of potential conflict by each leader. The new supplement gives significant attention to the old conflicts between the Ultramarines Primarch and Rogel Dorn that nearly resulted in a second civil war. And it makes it clear that the Black Templars know about that part of their history. Gilliman didn't know how Helbrecht and the Templars would react to the introduction of Primaris Marines, so decided to go straight to the High Marshal, believing that if he convinced him, the rest of the chapter would follow. For his part, Helbrecht thought the Ultramarines Primarch might be coming to bring the non-Codex compliant chapter to heal. On top of that, he was slowing down the High Marshal's pursuit of Gazkul Mag Uruk Thraka after Armageddon. As it turns out, Helbrecht was happy to embrace the Primaris, seeing a spark of divinity from the Emperor in their creation. The Primaris Marines represent a new weapon, one a master strategist like Helbrecht was not ready to turn away. Helbrecht himself eventually crosses the Rubicon Primaris, and it's rumored that the Templars may be better at surviving the process than other chapters. And Gilliman had not come to try to enforce the Codex Astartes on the Templars. If anything, he helped swell their numbers further with Grey Shields from the Indominus Crusade. Helbrecht swore an oath to continue to pursue the war boss, but Gilliman reminds him of his responsibility as High Marshal to defend the Emperor's realm. In the telling of this conversation from last edition, Helbrecht comes off looking pretty cowed. In this version, he and Gilliman strike a compromise. The High Marshal promotes an unspecified number of his own sword brethren to the rank of Marshal and tasks them with defending Ecclesiarchy worlds just like before. Meanwhile, Helbrecht himself continues to pursue the Beast of Armageddon. Even though Helbrecht has signed off on Primaris, the book does leave carve-outs for those who want to run pure firstborn armies. It states that some marshals are still skeptical of the new tech, or perhaps they're just too far away into the galaxy to have received it yet. It's worth noting that Grimaldus also crossed the Rubicon Primaris, but very little else is said about the Reclusiarch, easily the most well-known Black Templar there is. I found that pretty surprising, and it wouldn't surprise me if he makes an appearance in some Black Library material or a campaign book or something to explain what he's been up to. Three of the new active crusades are described in the supplement. The Purgus Crusade is described battling Necrons in the Vitrica subsector. The Tanhelm Crusade seeks to recover a lost black sword on the fringes of territory captured by Magnus the Red, and the Heimdall Crusade, numbering five fighting companies and more than 150 vehicles, is part of Indomitus Fleet Secundus. While the size of a fighting company is always variable, the number of vehicles present suggests something at least close to a full 500 marines, if not more. As usual, Games Workshop has left a lot of wiggle room for players' own headcanon in their crusades. The Templars are spread to every segmentum in the galaxy on both sides of the Great Rift, and are listed in most of the major war zones that have been described in 9th edition so far. There were also some tweaks to painting guidelines in the supplement. It gives some lore cover to that Bladeguard veteran from the Indomitus previews that was painted like an initiate instead of a sword brother, 
Ah, well, it turns out some sword brethren reject the honor of the red cross and trim as they give all their glory to the emperor because they're uber pious. Don't we feel silly? Anyway, yeah, black and white shoulders on a sword brother is fine now. But if you're like me and you paint according to the guidelines of the fourth edition codex, you're still good. One thing that is tricky about not having a dedicated book with a decent fluff section for over 15 years is that there's been a lot of conflicting lore from other sources. In particular, it seems like the novella Eternal Crusader from 2014 changed a lot. This book clears some of that up. First, all the stuff about Helbrecht and the Templars falling to their knees to honor astropaths is long gone. Now they're back to being filthy witches and navigators are dirty mutants, and both are treated a little better than slaves on Black Templar ships. That particular bit of lore in the past did rankle a lot of Templars players. Good riddance and praise be. Also, there was a weird bit of lore from Eternal Crusader that I don't recall seeing elsewhere, at least not before Eternal Crusader. There's no mention, either in the old codex from 4th edition or in this supplement, of there only being ten black swords to be wielded by Emperor's champions, but Eternal Crusader brings it up. This book says every crusade carries one, along with a set of armor of faith, and there certainly seem to be more than ten crusades active right now. In 4th edition, the black sword was more a title given to whatever piece of fancy war gear the Emperor's champion was given, and it didn't describe a specific weapon at all. Back in those days, every fighting company had its own champion. If there were only ten to begin with, we know for sure one was destroyed, and this book states one is lost, so that would leave eight which just isn't enough. One thing the supplement does double down on from Eternal Crusader is that even a neophyte can have a vision of the Emperor and become his champion. That's right, anything from a neophyte to a marshal can take up the Black Sword. Finally, to the best I can figure, it was in Eternal Crusader that the Templars were portrayed as worshipping the Emperor as a literal god. Unsurprisingly, that is still the case. The ripples of this change can still be felt in Templar player circles, as the change was pretty abrupt, coming just a year after Blood and Fire, in which Grimaldus talks about the Imperial Truth and knows that the Imperial Creed really caught on after the Horus Heresy. Blood and Fire happens slightly after the Eternal Crusader in in in-universe timeline, and none of the praise bees are to be found in Blood and Fire. Still, it seems that those who are not happy with the religious turn will have to do what I had to do and get over it. Another fun tidbit is that the wordings of the vows in this book are word for word, exactly the same as they were way back in 4th edition. So that's fun. If you appreciated this breakdown of some of the lore updates in the new book, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button. All in all, I think they've done a decent job undoing some of the more egregious things that had some of my fellow sword brethren and I ready to declare our own crusade not too long ago. There's a lot more interesting lore in this book, and I plan to continue covering it. It wasn't my intent to make this a heavy lore channel, but the timing just really worked out for my favorite chapter, so here we are. So what do you want to hear more about? If you want tactical Templars talk by people who actually play the army, unlike some reviews I've seen before, <coughs> I highly recommend checking out the Implausible Nature channel. If you want more Templar lore, why not check out this video? Keep crusading, and I'll see you next time.